My name is Lily Flanders. I use she and her pronouns, and I serve as the vice chair of the Climate Action Committee here in Truro. And there are other committee members here tonight. Our chair, Carol Harris, is here. And then volunteers, by the way. <laughs> yes. um, Rebecca Brune, one of the founding members of the committee, is here. And then the best volunteer that any committee could hope to have, Yay. Georgia Neal, is in the back. Um, first of all, who here is not from Truro? Who has come? That makes me so happy. We, we really do want these sessions to be for the all the Outer Cape because these issues affect us all. Um, but it's often hard to draw people from more than a few miles up or down Route 6. So thank you very much for being here. Um, the rest of you obviously are from Truro. Or do we have Truro voters in the room? <laughs> Fabulous. Um, all of you are probably registered with it. Um, and I just wanted to let you know that if you are concerned about our climate crisis, and if you are interested in putting your angst into action, we always welcome volunteers. You can come and sit in on a meeting to see what we're about. We also um, welcome members who might want to go through the process to be vetted and, and see if we're a good fit for you and you're a good fit for us. So I just wanted to put that out there. Um, these sessions, these information sessions began in January. This is a new outreach effort for us. Um, and we do this in cooperation with the library, so we co-host these events. For, for that reason, we could not do them without Justine Alton, the outreach coordinator of the library, who has been the greatest help, and the rest of the staff, but Justine in particular um, has really made these sessions possible. We have a few upcoming sessions that I want to tell you about before we jump into tonight's itinerary. Next month, um, some representatives from Cape Light Compact will be here to talk to us about the reason it's important to go electric, particularly with the concerns about our grid already being dirty. Why should we go electric if we get our electricity from dirty sources? Well, we'll have some answers for that. Then in January, Jared Cabral, the head of the DPW, will be here to give a presentation about the workings of our transfer station, so you'll get to find out where trash really goes and, and what happens to all that recycling. In February, our own Georgia Neal, who is a retired therapist, will be leading a session about mental and emotional health, or, and health, health and health, hopefully, um, in the face of our climate crisis and what we can do about it. So stay tuned and keep your eyes out for more announcements around town, more announcements in your email inboxes. We'll be sending them out. Um, and if there's something that you're burning to learn about um, that has to do with climate, please let us know. Uh, we, we make these sessions out of our own interests and concerns, but if there's something that's really pressing on you, we would love to know that. Finally, I would like to thank the good folks at Stop and Shop for donating both um, beverages and snacks to each of these events. And I also want to give you sort of an idea of how the evening is going to be structured so that um, it's clear. I am going to introduce our panelists in just a few minutes. Um, after that, Emily Beebe is going to give us an overview of the water sources of the Outer Cape. And then I am going to present three broad questions that you all have in your laps, hopefully. And the panelists are going to answer and discuss um, these topics. The reason that I gave you those papers is that I'm going to ask all of you to save your questions for the end of the session. That way you can take notes and remember what it is that you want to ask. That allows us to stay on topic for Emily Beattie. Um, she has lived here on the Outer Cape since the late 1980s, and she has been the health and conservation agent in Truro since 2017. Before that, she filled the same role in Provincetown, Wellfleet, and Easttown. So she has served the entire Outer Cape. She has also served on volunteer boards and committees in each of these towns, and she was born in the year of the dragon. <laughs> um, Sophia Fox has been a specialist at the Cape Cod National Seashore since 2010, 
And as the aquatic ecologist at the seashore, she conducts scientific monitoring and research in the park's freshwater and coastal ecosystems. Andrew Gottlieb has more than 35 years of environmental protection experience in government. From 2007 to 2017, he was the executive director of the Cape Cod Water Protection Collaborative, and currently is the executive director at the Association to Preserve Cape Cod. Tara Nye Lewis has been on Cape Cod since 1998 and has worked with the Cape Cod Commission as a water resources analyst since early 2020. Her areas of expertise include coastal and pond ecology, watershed assessment and management, and water quality monitoring. So please help me welcome this amazing <laughs> Give us a, an overview yes. of the water resources. Can I do that from here, Lily? Of course. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. I also it's super brief. Perfect. Yes, yes go ahead. Uh, just to get us in the water. Uh, uh, just three, <laughs> three quick slides. Um, outer Cape groundwater resources. Um, just to provide an overview of groundwater resources. That's this front slide shows you the village pond, um, one of our favorites. It is, per Cape Cod Commission, a small linear pond with an associated wetland, suggesting that it may be a flooded glacial valley and not a cattle pond. Um, I've heard it referred to as a mystery pond, I'm not really sure of its origins, and it has several names, as you know, the village pond, Standish pond, uh, Pilgrim pond, there might be more. I don't know which one is accurate, so Village Pond is kind of the catch-all, I think. The other photo that's there is uh, working on pulling the water from the Pilgrim Lens out in the dunes. Uh, that is my daughter, Delilah. Oh. And she is at probably gallon number five. And on this particular pump, you, uh, after you prime it, you pump for about you know five minutes, and you get four gallons of sludgy, rusty water, and then it starts to come out really clear. But it takes a while. Um, and I just think that that image is wonderful to kind of illustrate the Pilgrim Lens, which is in Provostown. The next slide, please. So the Pamet Lens uh, is the lens of Truro and Provincetown, as we share it with Provincetown. Um, this lens supports a, a variety of surface water sources. Um, as I've um, noted, we've got our um, public water supply zone twos on this slide. Those are the purple, purplish blobs. Uh, and those are the water supply well uh, zone twos uh, from the Provincetown water system. We also have, um, pulling out of the pan lens here, um, quite a few community public water supplies or or public water supplies, but they're not municipal public water supplies. Um, you can see on this slide a uh, little blue oval between the purple blobs, that's Pilgrim Village Pond. Lots of dots on the slide, all of our private wells. Um, blue oval in the east side is the Pamet, uh, and to the east of that, the ponds in the National Park. And across the whole, Landscape on vernal pools and bordering vegetated wetlands, which interface with the salt water systems. So, a lot going on. And the last slide, please, is just to give you an overview of the four lenses of the Outer Cape, or the OC. Uh, looking from north to south, the Pilgrim Lens, and, and what you're looking at, there's a couple of things going on, but there's, a, there's some concentric circles or concentric shapes, and those are the lenses. So the, the, the Pilgrim Lens is Provincetown's lens. Uh, Pan it a little further south, and then Chequesset lens. You can see that's Wellfleet's lens, and um, we do also have the Chequesset lens into the southern part of Truro to the south of the Panet River. And the Nosset lens is uh, East Ham. And that's really it for this quick overview. Thank you. Just to get an image. Exactly. 
Okay, so let's go. Let's address the the first question. I'm going to put this out here for all of our panelists, so they will be able to bring their particular expertise to the question of what the current health of our water sources is. And um, if you could share with us your methodology, um, the frequency with which you measure health of our water resources, and even possibly over how long you've been able to collect data. And I will hopefully be able to jump to slides. If there are any slides that any of the four of you would like me to get to, just let me know and I will do my best to, to find them. Start there. I was actually thinking of Nick. I can start, but since I'm all right, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the reason I was going to have Sophia start is because usually people think about when they're talking about water quality monitoring, they think about ponds, and so Sophia is the go-to because the majority of the ponds in Truro are in the seashore and are monitored by Sophia. But I will jump down to um, drinking water. Drinking water. Um, is drawn up from the ground from our, our, our sole source aquifers that um, Emily pointed out. And the way that we monitor those, there isn't a, a lot of uh, monitoring of drinking of groundwater quality. The best way to look at your groundwater quality is either through a public, um, the province town water department. They test it all the time as it's coming through. So actually you can look at their annual uh, water quality report or confidence consumer consumer confidence report um, and that will give you kind of a high level look at what the water quality is in that in, in, the, in the drinking water which is I don't know, what's the same source as the groundwater um, the other way that we measure groundwater is looking at quantity of groundwater and we do this by looking at how far below the ground surface the water table is the water table is the top of the groundwater. Groundwater is, it is they call it a lens because it's actually mounted. It actually has that sort of shape to it. And so we'll measure, we have wells located all across the Cape, a couple, three here in Truro, and we come out once a month and lower a, a meter down to the, the, through the, down the well, and as soon as it sounds, we know we've hit water. And so we take that measurement, ground surface to water depth, and look at, and this, this we've been doing, well, I, I, it's older than me. I mean, <laughs> it's been being measured since 1962 in some cases. Um, 1962, 1964, 1974 were the beginning dates of the three wells in Truro. And so it, we have a very good long-term database of water, groundwater levels. I guess I could leave it there. Okay. Do you are there any slides that you would like me to find that? I, I don't. I don't. Unless there are people have questions about it, I'm, I think that it's pretty pretty straightforward. That information. I, um, the only thing I would add to it is, I'm not sure if anyone else is going to talk about the um, the marine water quality monitoring that happens. Um, we have stations, not we, Cape Cod Commission. The, there are like about seven different organizations that monitor the water quality of, of our embayments. And this is done um, various frequencies depending on which organization is doing it, anywhere from monthly to weekly, um, usually during the summer seasons, but some I think do it year round. And this um, information is also, actually it's, we have established just recently in the last few years, a centralized water quality database for the marine water quality data. And um, we will be adding the freshwater quality monitoring data to it. We're in that process right now. But all you can see from, from the public facing end of it is the uh, marine water quality. And there, I mean, they measure temperature, dissolved oxygen, all the nutrients, total nitrogen, total, uh, or, I think, orthophosphate, um, dissolved organic nitrogen, dissolved inorganic nitrogen, chlorophyll, uh, salinity. I may have missed some. But anyway, you get the idea. There's a wide range of parameters that are monitored on a regular basis. And some of this data goes back into the, I think, the 1990s. 19, oh, I wrote down, 1970s. Some of it goes back that far. So we have a really good amount of water quality data for the marine end of it as well. And the in terms of the current health of the marine water quality, I know that Andrew will speak to this at length, but um, generally speaking, it's not great. We have a lot of, um, namely, um, 
nitrogen, but also bacteria that is polluting our coastal embayments. And so, I didn't speak to the groundwater quality. It's it's very good. We have very good groundwater quality and drinking water quality, and the marine water quality is not as in good of good condition. And I'll pass the speaking baton. Why don't you take the baton, please? Okay. Uh, I'm going to pick up first on the marine water quality since I started that. Um, the Cape Cod National Seashore does a lot of marine water quality monitoring. Um, we have our main programs are in Pleasant Bay and in Nauset Marsh, down, further down south from the Outer Cape. Um, but we also have uh, long-term monitoring in East Harbor, also known as, you may know it as Pilgrim Lake. We like to call it East Harbor again, um, now that it is a return to brackish saltwater system. Um, and we've been monitoring water quality in there since, um, I think around 2000. It was partially restored in 2002, and so we have consistent water quality in that data from there since 2002. Um, and we've been seeing, the, it's an interesting system. It's not your um, kind of average healthy uh, coastal water body um, due to the fact that it's connected to Cape Cod Bay by a 700-foot long pipe. Um, that, that really makes a difference. Um, so the tides in Cape Cod Bay are something like you know, 8 to 10 to 12 feet. And once you go through that 700-foot pipe, it goes down to about 3 feet. Um, and then it crosses again under High Head Road in Furrow, um, and then it goes down to just about 10 inches, the tide range. So that small amount of tide getting in from Cape Cod Bay has really cleaned up East Harbor, brought in um, the salt water, um, and also all of the marine flora and fauna that we like to see there. So uh, we've been doing a lot of work there on the recovery. Uh, we see a lot of fluctuations in water quality there, um, it's generally not high in nutrients, like Tara was talking about, that impacts a lot of the other coastal waters um, due to its watershed being mainly dunes. But um, we do see a lot of issues. It's very shallow, only seven feet deep, and a lot of issues with temperature and other things. So it goes through a lot of boom and bust with the um, Organisms that live there, they'll do really well for a few years and then die out and something else will come in. Um, right now we've been have a study where we're really looking at the recovery of the horseshoe crabs. Some of you may have heard about that in the paper. Um, and they're, they're doing quite well in there. Um, so we're feeling like, um, although it's on this kind of cycle of boom and bust and it's not consistent, it's um, doing okay, I would say. Um, um, uh, health perspective. Um, so I'll jump to the... So um, I lead one of the, the um, a lot of the water quality monitoring programs at the park, including our uh, groundwater monitoring, which we also monitor groundwater levels in, um, I think, 17 wells around the Otter Cape. Um, but the main thing that we do is we monitor the pond water quality. And we've been doing that since the 19... 70s, um, we have that program sort of follows um, a stricter routine since the mid 80s, and so we feel really confident in the data that um, is coming since then. It's one of the longest freshwater water quality uh, programs in the country, so it's extremely valuable. And with this water quality monitoring work, we've been able to measure a lot of the changes that we've seen over the last several decades. So we go out um, in our canoe to the center of each of the ponds in Truro. Unfortunately, we only work within the National Seashore, so not at Village Pond, which isn't a cattle pond anyway. This is a cattle pond. Um, and we go out there from March through December and um, bi-weekly. And we take all of our equipment and we measure things like um, temperature, pH, oxygen, how light moves through the water, uh, so water clarity, nutrients, um, and our uh, phytoplankton biomass through chlorophyll concentrations, among other things. 
And so with these data, we're able to see how these plants are doing over time. And um, I guess, really, I have to skip to the, um, I think it's the third to last slide. I want to talk about health. It's got a bunch of green dots. Condition assessment. Yeah. Um, so we have just begun um, the preliminary steps, it's not complete, of doing a condition assessment of several of the ponds within the National Seashore. Um, one of which is Great Pond and Furrow, shown here in the center. Uh, where we've looked at a number of these parameters that we consider to be indicators of quality or change. And we've evaluated them based on standards that exist. Um, generally, they're either uh, regulatory standards from the state of Massachusetts or from the Environmental Protection Agency, how they assess whether a water body is essentially healthy or impaired. And um, not surprisingly, as many of uh, the all ponds that I look at are within the National Seashore, and many of them are relatively um, underdeveloped. We say they're not undeveloped. Um, we find that they're in very good condition by these standards, um, indicated by a green circle. Um, but what, one of the things that we learn as we go through this process is what kind of uh, trajectory they're headed down. While we look at um, their condition today, we also look at how they've been doing over the past decade or so. And that's indicated here by the arrows in the middle of the circles. So if it's a horizontal arrow like that, it means they're stable. Um, and then if you uh, scroll down one slide, um, you can see that in some, some ponds or arrows or things are going up um, or down. In most cases, uh, by the standard assessments and where we've gotten to so far, the ponds out here are doing very well. And they're all in good condition and their trajectories are generally in the right, right direction, except when it comes to temperature. We can talk more about that we get into the effects of the climate um, and what the impacts are on our ponds from those those drivers. So we do have a lot of concerns for our ponds, even though they're in good condition. There are a lot of changes taking place even though they're within the National Seashore. Um, namely, one of the major changes that we see is the development around the ponds. Although there aren't new homes being developed, there are um, small cottages that are being replaced by large homes. Those homes are also have gone from occupancy of a few weeks a year to um, even like eight months with rentals. Um, so there's a big change actually going on that you can't always see. And so we're seeing impacts in the ponds that um, I think we'll measure down the road because our groundwater moves slowly. Um, but we're also seeing <coughs> recreational impacts and um, erosion and other things. So I'll talk more about that. Andrew, do you want to, to weigh in? Sure. So, we're a little, at APCC, we're a little different than colleagues here, and we're non governmental. Um, and with the exception of some freshwater data around cyanobacteria, and then some new work we started doing this year under a contract with Cape Cod Commission to do something called the Freshwater Initiative. You know, we're looking at 50 ponds across the region. Uh, try and do a broader baselining, catch up in many respects to, or not catch up, but begin to get some of the same rigorous monitoring that the seashore ponds have benefited from for a longer period of time. So that's the exception, not the rule on the Cape. Uh, we don't know a heck of a lot about freshwater environment uh, on the Cape. So we do a report every year called State of the Waters for Cape Cod. It's going to come out in about a month. Um, <coughs> Tell Joey how I said that. Um, that looks back a year and uses publicly available data from Seashore, from the Commission, from the individual water suppliers, from the various organizations, the six or seven uh, 
the terebinth and they're doing sampling in the marine environment. Um, and we evaluate the quality and health of estuaries, freshwater ponds, and drinking water. Um, and we do it using um, state public health, drinking water standard regulations, and state water quality regulations. Um, and take a lot of complex information and basically for the surface water, but the fresh salt, rate them on a pass-fail basis. So if you go on our website, go to the State of the Waters Report, look broadly, you'll see a bunch of blue dots, and which is indic indicative of good water quality, especially in the marine side, a lot of red dots, which is indicative of water that fails. And so, you know, the basically, you know, across the region, 90% of the Cape's 53 estuaries uh, fail to meet state water quality standards. Um, there's not a single south-facing estuary in Cape Cod that meets standards. There's one that faces Buzzards Bay. Most of the high quality waters that are remaining are north facing or adjacent to Cape Cod Bay. Uh, but even there, we're starting to see uh, signs of uh, decreased water quality in large systems. Barnesville Harbor, two years ago, went from blue to red, 12th Fleet Harbor. Also, it has portions of it that are, that are poor water quality. Um, and there aren't that many left to go back. But it's the expectation that we have that things will continue to get worse for some period of time because um, even though more and more towns have begun to invest in wastewater management infrastructure, it takes a while to build these things and it takes a while once you stop adding nutrients for septic systems for the residual nitrogen that's in the groundwater working its way through the system. So it continue to have a lag effect, um, which is not in any way, shape, or form an argument why towns shouldn't continue. You have to stop adding insult to the water resource if you're ever going to expect it to heal. The fact that it doesn't respond the day you stop doing something really bad for it is not an indication that the efforts are not worthwhile and will not ultimately succeed. The freshwater environment, um, there are 900 ponds of 10 acres or more on the Cape. Um, Only 100. No, I'm sorry, 900. 900 ponds, uh, 100 or so. Right, right. okay. Um, we monitor, or we have data available to us for about 140 to 150 that is sufficiently robust to use to evaluate the quality of the water. So in other words, what that means, our standard is, there's three years of good data that's no older than 2000, and, I think this year's report, 2018. So that we're not looking back at something, three years of data that was collected in 2001 through 2004, trying to tell you that that's what's happening now. So there aren't that many ponds relative to the whole that there's enough data being collected on. Of that, about 40% of them don't meet standards. And that means one of two things. It either means that they've got a state water quality problem that fails the test we use called something called the Carlson Trophic Index. It basically you know, shows that these ponds through a combination of temperature, <coughs> oxygen, uh, turbidity, you know, are showing signs of decline and then sort of advanced aging um, and transitioning more from a clear freshwater system into a, ultimately a marshy type system over a period of time. Um, so a bunch of them are measured on that, but only about 35 or 40. Um, the rest of them get evaluated based on the work that we've been doing, and this is where we do collect a fair amount of data around cyanobacteria blooms. Um, we've been doing about 150 ponds a year for the last two or three years, um, doing them in all 15 towns. And if a town, if a water body has sufficiently high levels of cyanobacteria to warrant a closure by the town health agent, then that pond automatically gets a, a failure for that particular year. So we're seeing, you know, more more of that. Um, it's hard to tell you whether things are actually getting worse or not because we haven't been doing it long enough to have a really good feel for it. Um, the general sense that we have in looking at the data is that um, cyanobacteria is more widely distributed than we thought. Um, it's at higher concentrations 
when there is a bloom, then they persist for a longer portion of the year than anticipated. So we have a couple of ponds. Our, our program wrapped up this week. Uh, we still have five ponds, I think, that have sufficiently high uh, cyanide blooms to warrant closure by the municipality or, or concern by the municipal health agents, you know, in November. Uh, so we don't really know whether this was happening 10 years ago and nobody was looking uniformly, so, or whether it's getting worse. Uh, it's interesting that our data is sort of year over year over year, now we've got a handful of years, kind of hanging around 39, 40% of the ponds. Uh, it's pretty consistent. It's not the same ones every year, uh, which is confounding. Uh, but there's a whole, there's a class of them that are vulnerable. Um, and, you know, as, uh, Sophia said, you know, you're in better shape out here, but you're not immune. Yeah, and I'll talk a little yeah. more about our standard. Um, and then in terms of drinking water, you know, we evaluate the 20 public water supply systems on Cape Cod, municipally owned public water supply systems, 15 towns, 20 systems. It tells you a little something about how municipal government functions, and some towns, Barnesville has five public water suppliers, distinct public water supply systems that serve different portions of the town. Um, of the 20, yeah, of the 20, 18 of them have really good water quality. Um, and, you know, the two that didn't, you know, had some bacteria, a little bit of bacteria issues and some PFAS issues. PFAS issues are generally fairly ubiquitous across the region, um, not just Cape Cod, but everywhere you look, you're going to find it. Um, but water supply is in pretty good shape. As a rule, it's reflective of what Tara said. You know, the groundwater is pretty good shape, and groundwater that serves public water supplies tends to be the best because towns generally have, took it, have taken efforts to protect the land area adjacent to and around the water supply wells, either through public ownership of the well of those lands or um, through restrictive zoning that protects um, and limits the more. Uh, dangerous uh, land use activities that might contaminate water supplies. We've done a really good job as a region on water supply. Done a pretty horrific job when it comes to managing and protecting our water. Do you want to add anything? I did this. Okay, I did. Just um, fresh water monitoring. Yeah. 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 The public water supply um, monitoring is done by the town of Provincetown for the municipal public water supply. Um, that is based on. The requirements of the state, it's very rigorous testing, it's happening monthly, and the uh, town of Provincetown is, you know, they have their water department, which operates the system. Um, the system is pretty, um, you know, spread apart, as you would imagine, as the water supply uh, comes from Truro here. We have the North Union Field well site. Um, we also have the South Hollow well site and the Knowles Crossing well site, and Knowles Crossing is also location of the water treatment uh, facility where the water is treated for iron manganese and it is disinfected uh, but it is excellent water quality and uh, other fresh water monitoring really is done at the private well level uh, we have numerous triggers in place for uh, residences um, uh, property owners who are moving forward with projects that need permits if you need a permit test your water first, we try to really tack that on to as many procedures as possible so you have a good idea of what the water quality is on an ongoing basis and so that you do. We are trying to encourage people's curiosity about what is coming out of their own tap. Um, if it is, if you're on the municipal water system, um, you, you really shouldn't be um, investing in pulling pul pul springs. I just wanted to put that out there. So a lot of people, um, too, which is weird, but they don't understand where their water comes from, and that's part of, I think, the beauty of something like this, so we can educate the public. But uh, the freshwater monitoring also happens at the uh, public well level, which is not the municipal well level, which is the largest one. And that is, for instance, Montana's has a public water supply, but it's a non-community public water supply. He too has. Uh, a very rigorous water testing program. So anyone who runs a business here in town or wealthy, because we have a very similar profile, they have um, 
certified water operators that will take care of their water quality uh, uh, sampling and analysis. They do the reporting out to the state. They ensure that their zone ones are protected and that sort of thing. So that is an ongoing regulatory basis that um, the health department is a part of with the state of Massachusetts. Um, marine water quality monitoring is going on in part you know, with what's happening in East Harbor with the National Park Service. And we also are having the um, sensible stations tested um, by the Center for Coastal Studies. Well, they do the sampling. I believe that this is uh, coordinated through the county. Um, I wanted to back up a little bit because I am anticipating where the questions are going to come from. But other communities, uh, most other communities, in fact, uh, I think all other communities, <laughs> other than Truro uh, and Provincetown, um, have been through the Massachusetts Estuaries Project um, evaluation of their uh, invaders. We went through a preliminary uh, uh, investigation of East Harbor, um, Pennant, Provincetown Harbor, and Hatches Harbor uh, back in about 2010. And that preliminary investigation indicated that there was um, um, moderate water quality, Provincetown Harbor and Hatches Harbor, poor water quality in the Panic and in East Harbor. Um, that probably should have gone to another level of investigation at that time, um, but it was not prioritized by the state, and things just kind of uh, slipped to the back burner um, under the county. 208 plan. Um, if you do not have a TMDL or a D, uh, mass estuaries project evaluation, there is a 25% uh, nutrient removal threshold goal that's assigned to communities where there is no TMDL. So we're operating under that goal right now of trying to just broadly reduce our nutrient uh, loading to the panic lens, generally speaking, how are we doing that? We're doing that by really starting to address our stormwater, uh, really looking at um, opportunities where we can um, ensure that properties are meeting their nitrogen loading standards by using IA systems. Uh, we have engaged with GHD, an engineering firm who's working on our comprehensive wastewater management plan. And what they're doing is they're looking at the entire town in order to uh, provide us with a better planning number if 25% removal of nutrients is not adequate. So we're on target to have a better understanding of where our nutrient reduction needs to happen in order to you know, help our zone twos, help our Um We are, as part of that, they are talking to the town of Provincetown about possibly uh, Provincetown taking uh, wastewater from Beach Point. As we now know, that the wastewater from Beach Point more than 50% of the time is heading to East Harbor. So in order to address that very challenged containment, this has become a priority under our comprehensive wastewater management planning program. Provincetown is in conversation with our engineers to examine the feasibility of that proposal. Can we take wastewater from each point? They have um, set aside an amount in their planning process currently, but we are still looking at the finances with them, and so we'll I'm sure we'll know in the next few months whether or not that feasible is, is in fact, yeah. So, Board of Health is very optimistic about that, I have to say. And that's all I want to say at this point. But there's a lot going on as far as nutrient uh, management relative to our, our protecting our water uh, resources, and we just can't underscore that enough. I also want to add that the management plan, what, comprehension, comprehensive waste water management plans that you know, is under, um, it's being created as, as I speak. And the third of this three-part series on water, which will probably happen next fall, will be about this comprehensive plan. So stay tuned because there will be a rollout and you're going to hear all about it when it is finally completely um, ready to, to go public. All right, so the second question, and since we are here um, with a climate change lens, the second question is, what impact from climate change have you seen in the water sources? Um, and secondly, what actions of mitigation or adaptation um, are your organizations undertaking? So anyone who wants to run with that, talk about the impact that you're seeing 
changes in our system and we are lucky to have these long-term data sets to understand what's happening since the you know 70s and 80s so we can actually um, tie some of the changes that we've seen to climate change um, so there's two major changes happening along our landscape out here on the outer cape um, one is change does change to atmospheric deposition which um, is a positive change where we have seen um, back in the 80s acid rain was a big problem um, that was due to uh, emissions from power plants uh, polluting the atmosphere and then and that actually was happening largely like thousands of miles away from us traveling through the atmosphere and so we had high levels of these acidic compounds raining down on our landscape penetrating into our what we've seen uh, is a bit of recovery from that with the, the Clean Air Act in the early 1990s has reduced those emissions considerably and we've seen, um, I'll actually have a photo of it here, I'll tell you what we've seen. Um, so we've actually been measuring the compounds in precipitation here in Turo um, since the 80s. Um, and then as far as climate change goes, uh, not, um, not so much on the positive side, we've seen warming temperatures. Uh, and this little um, cartoon on this slide shows that the warming air temperatures we've been seeing, um, there's a little picture of Massachusetts there. This um, slide, this picture is from a paper from two, so it's quite old. And um, there's two different colors there, there's yellow and red. In 2007, yellow was considered our low emission scenario where um, kind of the um, best case scenario for the future and red was considered extreme. Today, we have already reached yellow um, and red is considered most likely. So today, um, the Massachusetts of 2007 is gone and we feel like New York felt in so we're already warmer, considerably warmer. Um, and by 2070, on the path we're on right now, we will feel like South Carolina. Um, and that is um, pretty, with some certainty. Uh, in addition, we're seeing a lot of um, changes in our climate with a little bit of abnormal precipitation, let's say, um, where we have more droughts primarily out here on the Outer Cape. We haven't seen so much in terms of more rainfall, except that it's falling in larger amounts at a time. So we'll have these two inch, four inch rainfalls um, more than we have the, dri the drizzle events that we were more accustomed to earlier. Um, and then of course we have sea level rise. Um, those projections are similar uh, to the warming projections where back maybe 10 or 15 years ago, we had projections, those projections have kind of got, were based on just the raising the air temperature, water expands, and so the oceans were going to get bigger and take up more space, covering more land. But now we've got to such a heating, um, a place of heating where the glaciers are starting to fall apart and uh, we're starting to see so much melting that's contributing to more water to the oceans, and now the project, projection is a rise in sea level is um, really large and something that we don't want to have to deal with. So, and it is a lot of it. Um, the outer cape tends to be a bit taller, um, and our low point is actually at the Orleans Rotary. Um, and I heard from Heather a little bit ago, a couple days ago, that uh, at the Cape Cod Commission that they're looking at ways to mitigate the Orleans Rotary so that outer cape doesn't become an island, even though they might want to. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get some stakeholder input. <laughs> yeah. um, so, uh, so, you can find another slide. Yeah, why don't we go to the third one? 
Um, so I already told you that we're measuring, we've been measuring the um, change in the ponds over um, the last several decades. But in addition, we have this site uh, for air quality that we've been measuring air quality and the impacts on precipitation since 1982. And we measure things like pH, uh, sulfates and nitrates, which are those acid compounds um, in the water that's raining down on and we also use data in the form initially from the Chad Airport Area Public Health. Um, so we've seen a really positive and significant recovery from acid rain due to the Clean Air Act and the cleaning up of emissions. And what we've seen is that in our rain, which is in the top right there, the pH of our rain has increased by a whole uh, pH unit from about 4.4 5.4 since uh, 1996, uh, over several de decades, and that is about a 10 times less acidic, acidic water falling down on us, which is very substantial. And 4.4 uh, is um, very acidic. <laughs> it's not quite like uh, lemons, but it's, it's acidic. Um, and then I have on in the lower part of this slide the pH of Great Pond and Truro, which is reflecting that same change in pH, where it has increased pH over the same period of time by about a half a pH unit. So we're seeing that these, what's happening in the atmosphere raining down on us is directly impacting what's happening in our pond. Um, and uh, Great Pond and Truro is actually reacting a little less than other ponds in the region, um, maybe due to the fact that it was to the full pH back in the 80s, um, and that has some residual impacts in the pond. Um, Great Pond and Wellfleet has increased two pH units over that time of it, which if you're a plankton, that's a lot. <laughs> um, so um, we'll go to the next slide. Experiencing these major changes in acidity over this time period. In addition, we've seen the changes um, with temperature. So there's a lot happening in here. Um, these are air temperatures from the Chad Airport um, over the summer months from July to October. It's, July is the, the top, and October is the bottom. So we're obviously in October. Um, and what we've seen is these are maximum daily across the years, and we've seen a one to two degree Fahrenheit increase in temperature every decade. So over the um, three years, three decades or so, we've seen almost a six degree increase in, in temperature. The Fahrenheit's on the right side of the chart there. It's usually top in Celsius in my world. Um, so that's substantial. Um, and this is um, mainly happening from July In addition, we looked at actually the minimum temperatures, so the daily low temperatures, and it's actually in the low temperatures where we've seen the biggest change. So our nights are not getting as cold. So we're not having that cooling effect every evening on our landscape and on our waters. And so we've seen actually a one and a half to three degree Fahrenheit change per decade in our minimum temperature <coughs> over this time period with the most change in October. And what we see is kind of the, again, the same thing in our ponds. These air temperatures are directly, the air is directly interacting with our surface water from our ponds. And we see that the pond water temperatures are increasing in these kind of from summer through fall periods of about the same as the air, about one to two degrees Fahrenheit per decade. Um, and this is just showing pond versus air temperatures, they're like exactly related to one another. So whatever is happening, whatever we see in our air temperatures, we're basically thinking the same thing about this pond. Have you seen more of a current line in the pond too as well? Yes. Longer, mainly. So um, so ponds have, 
this was kind of a thought of mine. Yeah, so ponds have a natural, um, it's called stratification, where the pond surface waters get warm in the spring, and they separate from the bottom waters, and then there's this middle section, which has this sort of a thermal plane where they don't mix. And, um, and with the warm waters on the top, then they, they last longer now, so usually in the past, September. Now we see it in October, November. So it's longer, and not only is it longer, it's stronger. It's more of your breaking. So, um, and that keeps all the bottom waters um, without oxygen. So uh, it makes it a more unhealthy system. It's harder for fish to survive, and um, a more, tired, more, more stressed out system. Than yeah. Um, one of the other things that we've seen look at our data over the years, and we took this threshold, um, it's 25 degrees Celsius, which equates to about 77 degrees Fahrenheit for surface water temperatures, which is this approximately a place where uh, it gets stra stressful for life in the ponds. Um, and what we've seen over this time period from the 90s to present is that we're seeing more and more observations of temperatures that are exceeding these values to the point now where we used to see them sometimes, but then the next year it would be cooler and go back and forth, but now we never see it cooler. We always see a huge number of them, and in 2023, you see the most. Um, and so, so what? Um, so what we were talking about, the thermocline, the first thing changes in the thermal structure, it's thicker, it's deeper, Last longer, um, but we also see ecological impacts. Uh, we have this big change in pH, so the ponds have become uh, more neutral, which is great, um, and that environment would be helping our plankton diversify, more things would be able to live, so that's a great situation. But what's ending up happening is that the waters are getting warmer, and that's stressing out everything near the surface, and it's favoring mobile plankton, things that can swim up and down and get out, escape those hot waters. And um, and so we're seeing this shift, so everybody really can't live there. And um, and anything that changes in the plankton is going to impact everything else in the pond because everything relies on it. Um, and so what we've actually seen in the plankton in a um, study that we did in 2021 was that our ponds are now dominated by cyanobacteria, which is a highly mobile plankton. And um, we believe in the seashore that we are seeing uh, increased occurrence of these harmful pollutants in our ponds due to this dominance. Um, so, We've gotten a bit of media attention for this. Um, the picture with the paddle bird is a dryer pond in Peru of a typical paint spill kind of cyanobacterial bloom. Um, we've been seeing these in our ponds where we consider, I showed you earlier, the water quality is good. So um, I would say the general theory is that you get cyanobacteria blooms where water quality is degraded with high nutrients, the conditions aren't healthy, and you get cyanobacteria blooms, but that's not the case uh, for most of the ponds in Peru and in the seashore, but yeah, they still have blooms. And so we believe that the blooms are there for that reason that I just described, that we've got these warm temperatures uh, and these conditions that are really creating them cyanobacteria that would take care of those species. So we're competing against Um, here are some more pictures of blooms um, on the right. That snow pond last fall. We're seeing a lot of our blooms in the fall, so we're seeing that that intense warming, which is in some ways better because that's not when most of us are swimming. Um, but still, you know, we're seeing a lot of them. And here's a little chart of the occurrence of blooms in our ponds in the seashore. Um, in 2019, we had our first official bloom 
recorded um, in Gold Pond in Royal Lake. And um, we saw another one there in 2020. And then in 2021, we saw one in Ryder Pond and in Gold Pond. Um, and then in 2022, things went crazy. <laughs> and we work with APCC. Um, so in general, um, the turtle ponds are not regular, regularly monitored, but when we see a bloom, APCC comes out and um, starts monitoring and we track it and we work together to um, make sure that the public health is protected and pets are protected. We're collaborating with Emily on that. Um, so in 2022, things kind of went crazy. We had um, 14 cyanobacteria blooms, most of which were in turtle ponds. And, um, Um, and then this year, I have a one plus there because um, we have one official bloom that has been identified and recorded. However, um, I think that we've had more blooms that we haven't observed. We haven't been out there. Um, I just feel like we haven't been out there quite as much this fall. Um, and we have had many ponds wealthy go into the potential for concern category, which is a potential bloom. And if you're not out there kind of watching that on a regular basis, you might not actually observe it as well, um, like we see here. So um, so I think there were more than one kind of bacteria bloom this year, even though that's the only one we have officially. Um, you will start seeing at all the ponds this sign. We're working on making sure that you guys all know what to recognize, be able to recognize the first thing because you don't want to open the water and you see your pet just kind of um, clean water. So we want to put it in your hands to recognize that there's a risk of it be there all the time and to make sure that the water stays. So you will see one of these uh, signs at every pond um, within the seashore. Can I follow that up? Then I, I have actually um, the opposite. I, I'm not, uh, not to say not even bloom, but actually, did you come up my slides? There's a lot of slides in there that actually cover a lot of what Emily said in the beginning. And actually, I have a few in there with you. I didn't realize that. that uh, and these are actually not official slides. These are more like screenshots that I have two language onto, so don't tell my boss. <laughs> um, this is, you can go past this slide, actually. Those of you in payments that Andrew was talking about, so we're mentioning these from the move from the payments that Andrew was talking about. Keep going. Um, is that way? Go back. Yeah, so that image shows you where all the water quality monitoring stations are throughout uh, in the marine environment, the coastal embayments and the marine end of things. You can see all the stuff all over the place, so it's really great. But one thing I want to say about cyanobacteria, there are a lot of things I want to say about cyanobacteria. One is that it exists in our ponds, has always existed in our ponds. It's not suddenly, all of a sudden, here and everywhere. In fact, it's what created our environment, the reason that we can, we can live on this planet. So, yay! <laughs> <laughs> the other thing about cyanobacteria is that because just because you see cyanobacteria doesn't mean that it's producing or releasing the toxin. Not to say I would encourage you ever to swim if you see a scum or a smear of cyanobacteria, but it doesn't equate, one does not equate, you have to actually test for the toxin um, in order to know whether the toxin is present. And cyanobacteria, when they make toxin, it's a kind of expensive thing for them to do, so they're not just readily spitting it out. They only let it release if there's cells are broken open or they're dying. Uh, but you, don't, you can't tell that. You can't see that while you're standing there deciding whether you or your dog are going to go swimming. So if you do see it, don't go in the water. And it takes us like a week to get back in the dark and it's expensive. So we have to do a lot of testing. So those are just important things to understand about cyanobacteria. Um, and the other thing is we can well I didn't go there. So, <laughs> uh, so this is 
Okay, so to look at how climate change is impacting um, our water resources. These are all the stations, as I said, around the Cape. If you look at the next slide, it shows you temperature, specifically temperature from 1994 to 2020. And so you can see, of course, up and down, up and down. But what we want to look at is the general trend, which is upward. And it's not like dramatic, but over the course of those years, we're seeing a definite upward trend. So I'm basically just reiterating. And then in turn, I don't actually have any other water quality, I mean, marine. Um, I was actually going to speak to groundwater and it, the impact of climate on groundwater, which really there isn't, we haven't seen much of an impact. What we mostly see is um, a change in precipitation. We get, you know, we get 2018, incredible year for rainfall, incredible year for precipitation. We had higher than normal ground water levels, exceeding most other years. And then come 2020, 2021, 2022, 2021 and 2022, droughts, like really bad droughts. Um, not, um, and, then, and then 2023, this year, we have an incredible amount of water. But the thing about rain now, well, during the summer, is that it's our growing season. And so as the rain's falling, it's just getting sucked up. Part. Very little of it makes its way down to the groundwater. A little bit does, but not a ton. So we will see. We'll, so we'll be learning about the impact of the amount of rain that fell this year later on in the season in the winter, and then wrap it around into the 2024 when the report of fall begins in 2024. Um, so it's not so much um, a trend. We don't see a trend in groundwater one way or the other. What we're seeing is reflected, reflective of the dramatic. Increases in frequency and an amount of rainfall, and then dramatic decreases in you know, drought, no rainfall situation. Those are, that's primarily what we're seeing. <laughs> so, from our perspective on it, this is like the world's worst design experiment. Because instead of changing one thing and measuring it, we're changing everything. Trying to tease out from that what the various influences are. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. You know, one of the things some people talk about about you know atmospheric deposition. We one work with the county back in probably the mid 20 teens. We had Dr. Valiela do a study uh, that looked at nitrogen deposition as a result of changing airflow patterns. And basically, what that study showed was in addition to cleaner air. Anybody doubts that this regulatory scheme is actually important and works? I think that has pretty good evidence. In fact, we don't have half the ponds anymore. Um, but in addition to that, because the atmospheric currents have changed as a result of climate, we get more of our air flow from the west and north than we used to, even though it's generally warmer and you tend to associate that warm air with totally with. And so we're getting air with less nitrogen from power emissions um, in northern, you know, northern uh, areas in Canada than we used to. So we've seen a significant reduction in nitrogen emissions, which is important when we're looking at the question of, you know, how do towns deal with their overall nitrogen problem because you can only control what you can control and you can't control what comes from the sky, right? So interestingly enough, Septic systems, the big increase in the amount of nitrogen that's going into the groundwater and ultimately going into our surface water has been offset almost one to one by the atmospheric deposition rate. And so, as bad as we allow things to get because of our choice on how we're going to manage wastewater, it would be all the time worse had we not seen that reduction in nitrogen deposition and changes in air time. So, we'll take that to mean that I think. To show that there's a lot of sides to this coin and try to 
expertise about it. Uh, you know, from what we're seeing, um, you know, the temperature issue in the ponds is a big one. The reason I asked about the thermocline is there's a lot of phosphorus in the bottom of these ponds. So those ponds were in oxic for long periods of time, and then they were leaking phosphorus back on those floors off. And making it's another one of these negative feedback loops. Seeing that change in, in the ponds, you know, we've got a lot of you know, the, the seashore ponds maybe a little bit differently. You have a lot in the more developed portions that gave you know a lot of uh, pressure around chemical treatments for you know alum treatments to lock up phosphorus, um, and so these thermocline releases are and oxic releases are adding into the core of the porous and pressure to do chemical applications. Maybe they have a role in the world, maybe they don't. Um, but again, we're sort of doing a big chemistry experiment here. So we're seeing a lot of that. We're seeing you know, changes in um, uh, storm patterns, especially around stormwater. Not every, most towns don't have a lot of stormwater conveyance systems, but those that do were designed for different worlds. Stormwater design engineers manual was not intended for the climate as Result is the system get overwhelmed um, many times a year now. This whole idea of a one in a hundred year storm or one in five hundred years is just so antiquated. Um, and so a lot of our infrastructure is inadequate. We're seeing you know, stormwater systems fail, and they when they fail, they fail into near a surface water body and they bring with it all the turbidity, all the chemicals, all the bacteria, so more shellfish closures as a result. So one of our responses is to try and work with towns to develop um, green infrastructure that's sized to what the world's turning into, not what the world was, and that uses natural systems to take nutrients and contaminants and bacteria out of these systems so that we don't lose access to those waterways. Um, you know, my town of Ashby, you know, we're very heavily invested in shellfish agriculture as Probably, you know, the town plan has lines on about 20 million coconuts and oysters going in our upstream rivers. Um, a lot of the area that was intended and set aside for propagation is no longer suitable because it's just too damn hot. So, Magic River, not uncommon for crack 90 degrees during the summer. Uh, we can't grow shellfish in those areas anymore. They had to. Summers ago, because of all capping, and it's fixating because the oxygen levels are so low. So, obviously, yeah, the animals, but really big impact on the town because you know that shellfish propagation program, if successful, would have result could be uh, used to offset what is anticipated to be about 190 million dollars in additional infrastructure investment to reduce that nitrogen source. Extend that that fails and is headed that way, um, you know, the taxpayers of the town are going to have to spend another 190 million bucks to expand the wastewater system to account for the fact that the natural system has been so beaten up in part by climate and in part in combination with what we did to it through nitrogen release from septics that we can't rely on the natural system to be able to cover. So that's a very, you know, that is going to play out differently in different towns. Insidious ways that it's had an impact, but it also suggests it's had an impact in Cape Cod Bay. Um, you know, the last three or four years, one in the inoxy zone. So if you draw a line from the canal to Wellfleet Harbor, everything south of that is not anoxic in the last four summers. Um, you know, temperature high, oxygen at the low levels cut off from the atmosphere mixing. As a result, different types of plankton that are growing uh, because the conditions have changed and you're losing all that habitat um, and not suitable for uh, you know, crabbing. Anything that gets stuck in 
a stationary setting and apply done. So you can use that loss and it impacts the concrete. So it's pretty widely um, a cross section of what we're seeing. You know, the other thing we see a lot because we do a lot of wetland restoration work um, is that you know with increased inundation, higher tides, you know, these marshes that rely on these cycles of inundation and, and drying out out as much, you're seeing a weakening of the overall ecology within those systems. And because we've tended to develop right up to the edge of the water, there's no place for that marsh to migrate. And so you're seeing here, while we're have great examples of restoration projects, and you know, here, you know, the Pelican River is probably, probably the biggest one. So there's a lot of successes out there, but we're fighting against the tide, literally. There's a lot of these smaller systems are the ones that aren't degraded necessarily under an enormous amount of strain. Um, and if we start to lose those habitats again, more feedback loop, and start with carbon sequestration capabilities of those marshes become lost. The habitats under those marshes become lost and it just perpetuates and accelerates the cycle. Um, um, there are a lot of um, to the final question. I'm also mindful of the time and I really want you all to be able to ask your own questions. So I'm going to ask the panelists to keep responses to this final broader question within 10 minutes. So maybe it will just mean that one or two of you want to jump in here. But finally, a great concern on the outer cape is how development impacts the quantity and quality of our water resources. Um, we're thinking we're looking at future developments here in Truro that are possible, and we'd also like to hear what the possible benefits to water health might be if we um, develop mindfully. So if a couple of you, or all four of you, want to jump in within eight and a half minutes, <laughs> that would be great. Um, I can speak to the quantity uh, of the 
groundwater uh, and drinking water. Um, groundwater, I, I did have a slide up there that shows that groundwater, it, it, is, it moves, it's not static. It moves, it's slow, but it moves. It's constantly moving out to um, Cape Cod Bay and um, the Atlantic Ocean, wherever you are in the Cape right now. Yeah. So it's moving constantly out and, um, and, and it's replenished by precipitation. Um, and the amount of water that we're pulling out of the system, and actually I think I have a stat from 2007, 2008, about we, to, to use the water to, for drinking, we pull out about 7% of it is water. So at least 25% of it is going out to the ocean. And also, we're recharging that, not just the precipitation, but we're also recharging that with, you know, it sounds gross, but with our wastewater. Whether it's being treated in a wastewater treatment plant or your backyards and your septic system, that ground, that is going into the groundwater. So it is recharging the groundwater mm -hmm. and drinking water. And so, um, right now, we're pulling up, I think, I'm not positive of the year on this, but we're, we pull up about 10% of that groundwater. So there hasn't been a big dent in our groundwater supply, is what I'm getting at. Yeah, so on the, on the development side, you know, we did a report recently called Hanging the Balance, which you can look at on the web for so fun. Basically, about 46% of the case developed, 40% is preserved. Remaining 14% is up for grabs, either development or on development transition. Um, what we do with that will say a lot about what's going to happen uh, in the future water quality case. But the reality is, this is true of energy, it's true of wastewater. The vast majority of the nutrient load that's impacting. Like to fight about what people want to do, but if that's what the fight is about, and you would say, All right, no more, all 14% is going to go into conservation. And we don't do anything else, so that allows you water quality, fragments and habitat, and declining surface water resources. And so, you know, development that happens. Places by our definition, that means areas you know, that are in town centers, growth zones identified by the commission, are in disturbed or underdeveloped areas, the priority habitat areas that we identify are important, the ones where we can concentrate our efforts to minimize and eliminate any future development. But until and unless we start dealing with how we dispose of the Existing septic waste that's 
going into the ground and causing a problem. We do more advanced treatment techniques. You know, some of these IA systems, um, you know, there are improvements to, to the type of standard Title V. They're not always a silver bullet, but they make things better. Um, you know, investment in wastewater infrastructure, municipal scale treatment, where it makes sense in a lot of our communities, um, provides the best way to lower nutrient levels the most and reliably in the way that you can quantify and monitor and also have the benefit of dealing with other contaminants as they emerge. Um, so, you know, development can provide some opportunities to fix some mistakes on the ground that currently exist. But I would caution people, and I say this wanting, of the 14%, which is 50,000 acres of case that remain undeveloped and unprotected, 40,000 of which is critical habitat area. You know, that's what we're sort of looking at. 40,000 acres is a lot to protect. But, you know, focus on the areas that make sense to protect and use potential for new development as a way to solve some of the problems there are now. Just keeping it all back doesn't get us anywhere. Thank you. All right, that brings us to 7.30, and I want you to be able to have an opportunity. Can I do a quick question? Yeah, yeah. Um, are these slides going to be available, or will you be able to have them distributed? I'm sorry, I can't give you those slides as they are. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to share them, but if it's not appropriate, better appropriate slides that I can share. Okay, that'd be great, and then that could be added to the video session. And if the slides are, can be shared, what we do is we do sign up for our mailing. We'll send you the appropriate slides as soon as we have them. So if you're interested in this, they will be made available in some form. It also occurred to me, um, and I would have created a slide of my own if I had thought of it in advance, that in order to be able to access some of the data that people here have been talking about, it would be helpful to know how to get to those websites. Um, if you did give me your email address this evening, um, we can make sure that you know how to find out is doing so that you can log in, find out, even find out from the frog sound, um, be able to check in at the end of the year to what the water quality is. So we are happy, I'll be happy to send those links to you um, so that you can access that data. And now with the, the last half hour remaining, please if you have any questions, here are the experts. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Alan, and I really appreciate every speaker that we've had here tonight. Um, what I understand would be an initial step would be to closely consider what each and every one of us is doing to the ground that we stand on. What are we dumping into the ground? As I understand it, that uh, to the Cape Cod Commission, uh, all municipalities within the Boston County and uh, under the guise of the Cape Cod Commission authorization, we can eliminate putting chemicals onto our lawns. We can initiate bans on chemical fertilizers, which contain phosphorus and nitrates. And why wouldn't we make this a first step? Why wouldn't we say, all right, let's, let, let's stop doing this. Um, we all know what the effect is. Um, a, lot of the pond, a lot of the ponds in the, sea, in the seashore are not surrounded by development. So it might not have as great of an effect there. But it certainly would be a, a, a step that we could all take in terms of what we do to the ground and the stand on. Thank you. It's not that easy, actually. Um, <laughs> the, the state um, in mid 20 teens uh, preempted local authority to regulate fertilizer pesticides. Cape Cod Commission, towns on the Cape were provided um, every year by which they had the option to uh, impose local bylaws limiting pesticide and fertilizer applications. Nine of the 15 did, I think. I thought it was nine of the 15. Um, once that door shut, it shut. So towns actually lack regulate locally. You may have seen that um, the 
first in town of Nantucket, and then Orleans uh, enacted home rule petition bylaws after the town meetings in 21 and 22 that um, laid out a um, framework by which they could regulate. All they got out of that was asking the legislature to provide a special law that would exempt them. Those home rule petitions have next to zero chance of passing the legislature. Um, our which attempted one this past spring, it failed narrowly. Uh, only went back to the pesticide ban uh, home rule petition last month uh, successfully. That's not going anywhere either. Um, so, you know, the Department of Agriculture, Agriculture Resources Estate, is heavily influenced. Industry professionals that advise them, and our strategy is we're going to be um, planning on providing sample language to all 15 towns for a model um, town meeting article this spring. It's non-regulatory, but it forms a sense of community that they like the ability to see Cape Cod specific, and Cape Cod sensitive regulations at the state level governing fertilizer and pesticide. And by that, we're trying to get enough critical mass so we can get the state regulatory agency to the table to have a meaningful conversation. But we're not going to, we're not going to hold pesticide and fertilizer issues on this one as much as we ought to. All that said, there's absolutely no reason why anyone on the Cape needs to fertilize their lawn or have uh, mosquito and tick spraying happen in your yards. Well. Right? You just don't. If you convert your landscape over to more native species that work in concert with nature, don't require pesticides and fertilizers, you're going to have a happier yard, more a live, more lively yard with animals and insects that can live there, uh, and one that is more drought and climate change resilient than one that is addicted to chemicals. So you can go all Today, you have to wait for the town to you to do it. You can just kick the habit. And there's a lot of information on our website yeah. on how to do that. Um, I, oh, plus, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I, would, I would actually suggest that your first step is not that. But your first step is to, to, to look in your backyard and get your septic system pumped if it hasn't been pumped in the last two or three years. You can do that. You don't need anyone saying you can, that is 100% in your control. And then the second thing is, um, is it a cesspool? Does that as well? Those, those are decisions in your hands. No one else can tell you you can't do that. So those are the immediate first step actions. And more of the nutrients are coming from your septic than your fertilizer, most likely. 80%. So that's the number one action item. Thank you. Uh, yes. Um, this is about septic systems. Is there a, uh, what are the alternatives to septic systems? Public health agency? Yeah, sure. There are, there are alternatives, uh, but they're not easy in Massachusetts to employ. You know, we've got, right, we've got compost and toilets. Park has been great, and Audubon has been great using compost and toilets. The issue with that is, gra is uh, gray water and how gray water is disposed of in the state of Massachusetts and like, you know, basically just kind of applies to that. Um, incinerating toilets, same sort of thing. So there are some options that are out there, um, but they're, you know, you have to really uh, work hard to go outside and force them on the yeah. Is there, is there a municipal Not that we're talking about yet. Yeah. Where, yeah. where you live. Okay. Let's, let's I mean, you know, most, probably more than half the towns either have or are in pretty close to EPA facilities and municipal flood plain treatment. So, four towns, five years ago, four towns. Um, 
Hutchins now has functioning treatment plan. Uh, Ashby's on the way of building one. It's just you know, above ground now. It'll be open next year. Uh, Harwich sewers to connect the Chatham system. Uh, Barnesville is spending about $100 million a year expanding their system. Now it's having a hell of a time getting past some of the alternative equipment people to move forward with theirs. So it's starting. So it depends where you are. Um, the towns collectively have $586 million in project proposals on the table for next year across the table. Now it's not equally distributed, um, but it's, you know, when we were projecting this out five years ago, we were looking at $68 million bucks a year. Municipal projects being sort of the target now are you know, over half a billion dollars. Um, so it's starting. You know, and just a, the other factor, not just hard, but you know, we're building, a, we're renovating a facility on our property, and as part of that, we want to compost and toilet, right? To lead by example. Three times, three times, the engineer who was working on the design of the project came back to us with plans that had a flush toilet. And felt like the third time, like if you come back to me with a, with he said, well, it's just easier. It's just easier. <laughs> Town of Dennis, Board of Health, they're cool with you know just you know, tie it into your existing septic system. No problem. You get through the regulatory process. No problem. Like that's not what we want. And it wasn't until I told him he came back with a flush toilet in that building that it was on fire <laughs> that we stopped seeing that design. So again, you're the customer. You can tell people what the hell you want. And don't let them force you. Disposal systems that don't meet your needs. Piggyback off on that, I think what I'm doing is not really thinking of the sewer aspect of it because yeah, most of us are so remote from each other out right. here and from right. the scene. But, you know, uh, cluster systems, I think, are something that we're going to be looking at more in the future. Well, probably as a result of our talking to the wastewater management and planning and looking for places where you can, you know, gain out solar power. So, you know, we'll see if there are. <laughs> it's in the first one. So I have a question for all of you. Um, you live in a free market enterprise system, and I would love if you could talk a little bit about um, existing market pressure or um, incentives for profit making for companies to develop technology to allow us, the homeowners, to retrofit our existing Title Fives to some type of IA. Um, you as, as organizations that are supporting, um, and not really the organizations, I guess it's a question, but you can bring, bring well, yeah, but, it's, uh, <laughs> but we, we as consumers have dollars, which um, may speak faster and louder. How, talk about how this could come to be through consumer pressure, to be able to do it, because you know, I look at what it costs to change my septic drive. And, um, but if there were technology and, and engineers working on this, and you talk about this, please, we're all up. So I'll do the non governmental one. Okay. Right? <laughs> uh, the lack of the regulatory requirement and any keys that made it okay. Groundwater it meant there was no market, right? So there was no incentive for people to go through that process. It's expensive and it's time consuming, but you know, if there's a driver, people will do it. So there's now a driver. Right? So DP just did regs um, that change the playing field that create a market for alternative septic systems, um, and the price is going to go down. So you know, the entrepreneurs aren't stupid. And they can look at now, they can look at Matt, they, not, let's say they can look at Matt Caesar. They can look at Cape Cod, but the regs only apply to Cape Cod, uh, and not all of Cape equally. Um, but it creates some market for people to begin to invest in these systems <coughs> and, you know, the reason to have some competition. So I think it'll get better. Um, the question you have to ask yourself is, you know, depending on where you are, and what problem you're trying to solve, whether investment in an IA system makes sense. You know, the towns 
comprehensive plan is going to identify the areas where nitrogen reduction, nutrient load reduction will benefit the broader environment. That may provide the incentives and requirements and like to drive people's behavior in those areas. I'm not a big proponent of waiting, but just think a little bit about what's the point. Uh, there are some areas where, you know, because none of these systems are currently approved by themselves, get you down to the levels that you need to restore the water bodies, less is better. reasonable argument say does it make sense for you to go out and spend 30 grand, 35 grand, put in a system to get you down to 19, and then five years from now the town might come along and say, we really need to connect you to the sewer system, small or big. Um, and so having the data and the outlook that Emily's working on, I think will really help guide what your behavior is and whether it makes sense, where it makes sense to put rare and special uh, uh, public can I just say, in response to Tara's comment, um, I decided to set to empty the flower septic every two years. Mm -hmm. And a few years ago, I thought, well, I wonder if I were to do this with other people in the neighborhood or friends, could we get a better deal emptying our septic every two years when you have other when you have other group of people, so that we have an immediate response to getting it more often. So I would recommend in your neighborhoods, gather a few of your neighbors together and say, let's call a few septic, you know, removal companies and see what they're offer if there are five of us that want to do it. So it worked. Then you also do it in February, do it in March, because during the season, yep, they have to taper the wastewater out of here in 20,000 acres because there's no place close by. To take it and if you take the if you take the you know the truck up pick, you want to make right. that work for you and not have four guys driving smaller trucks, right. one person is going, right? It's a real problem for us down yeah. here. So the guys I know that, that industry will appreciate you talking to them in the off season price. But still the off season. Okay. Different topic with seawater rising. Um, who knows how fast, really? But as it rises, how much do we have to worry about the the groundwater system getting infiltrated by salt? Um, yeah, it's really, the question. And, and, and unfortunately, I don't have a clear, one hundred percent guarantee answer. Um, we have not seen any evidence thus far of it happening in the at a private well or municipal wells. That said. Possible that it's happened, we just haven't been told. You might have, yeah, to well, just that. from a practical perspective, 2018, the big uh, flood year, uh, and it was frozen up. We had a lot of flooding because Washington infiltrated the ground. And we did have inundation of the wells that are in the floodplain because there was no eastern water to go, so private wells were inundated. Salt water, yes, exactly. Now, as far as salt water um, interfering with, with our groundwater. Actually, that's, that's, oh, yeah. that, yeah. that's, but that's not for this part of the state. No. Masterson's study in 2004 right. indicates 2016. No, we don't want to it's, when it's what Masterson's is about the outer shape. So okay. it, it addressed in the sodium upcoming. And you know, it doesn't look like there is uh, a lot of concern about it, but Masterson's work is also being visited too. Mm -hmm. and we are looking at right now uh, having some of the models evaluated. Yeah. 
rooted just by virtue of the fact that the last sentence was strengthened? I'm going to say yes, um, just from my quality results that we've seen in, in the office. That yes, your water quality uh, rates when we're in drought condition. So it's an elevated levels of river um, condition. But and generally speaking, just from experience, seeing higher sodium at the edges absolutely happens at the edges of, 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 the, of the land. So what could be done to protect those? Homeowners uh, from from this condition. I understand that Provincetown has a right to come to Toro and take as much water as it needs. Uh, and it has storage tanks. I, I just want to back up a little bit. I'm not sure that we can say that it's because of the Provincetown water supply. Right? And, it's, and it's withdrawing right. as much as it is that anybody who's withdrawing is going to realize a different contamination level, so to speak. Well, during the drought year period, and I don't know how because we haven't looked at it. I don't know what uh, the significance is of drought years for the Provincetown water system. There is Thank you. Thank all thank to all of you for coming and thanks particularly to